Akshab, and I am honored to serve on the Little Markets Council. Um, for those of you who don't know uh, the Little Market, they are a nonprofit organization committed to breaking the cycle of poverty for women globally. So um, I am delighted to be here today to talk about something that affects a large number of people, um, fully half the world's population, in fact, um, and yet it's something that is almost, you know, never talked about. So that is menstruation. And I am so happy to be having this conversation today with Amanda Classling, who is the co-director of the Women's Rights Division at Human Rights Watch, uh, and as someone who has done incredibly important work on human rights and menstruation and including breaking down the stigma. So thank you, Amanda, for being here. It's so nice to meet you. Great, thanks so much. I'm really happy to be here. Um, before we dive in, I wanted to give everybody a little bit of a context for this conversation. So the, the right to sanitation is a right that is out of reach for so many people around the world. About 27% of people living in, in developing countries have access to hand washing facilities in their homes, um, which is an important aspect of being able to manage your menstruation with, with dignity. About 2.3 billion people don't have access to adequate sanitation at all, which again, also makes this difficult on a monthly basis to be able to manage their menstruation. And this isn't just a problem in countries where um, infrastructure is weak. We see in countries like the United States that there's a water crisis that makes it difficult um, for people to access uh, the, the means to, to manage their menstruation. And in Scotland, just um, you know, one in five women report struggling to be able to afford menstrual hygiene products. And so this is a crisis that cuts across um, the world and across um, many different sectors. Yeah, I mean, those are some really staggering statistics there. I mean, it seems to be obvious, you know, that menstruation is a human rights issue. What was it for you that kind of opened your eyes to this problem? Yeah, it, you know, just being somebody that's doing the, the research in, in countries um, that are facing water crises or have difficulties with developing. I, I was doing the work um, in places like Haiti after the earthquake and, and knowing what it's like just to try to um, um, talk to people about getting access to water and, and that the context that people were living in were so outrageous, particularly um, after the earthquake, but something that kept on coming up for women was just how uncomfortable they were when it came to their personal feminine hygiene. They, they um, experienced um, ongoing discomfort and it was really difficult to talk about. Um, and it impacted other aspects of their life. So even though um, in, there were, there was little housing, there was lack of security in the displacement camps. One of the, the things that really struck at the dignity of people and of women in particular was this inability to manage menstruation. And as um, Human Rights Watch started to build out its global pro project on the rights to water and sanitation, when we talked to activists and specialists in, on water and sanitation around the world, one thing that kept on coming up is that menstruation is something because of gender inequality and decision making around the world is not um, typically on the agenda, either on the development agenda, on the political agenda, or even on the human rights agenda. And there's an important opportunity to, to just start saying period in places where it, it hasn't been polite to say it in the past and really create the space for, um, for programming policies and laws that, that address the, the barriers. So once we saw this issue, then it really took on a life of its own to, to expose menstruation as a human rights issue um, or menstrual hygiene and, and menstrual health as a human rights issue. People started coming forward and really sharing their stories and it certainly crosses so much of the work that we do from the disability rights work that we do within the organization to environment work, to children's rights, and of course, um, the women's rights work. Yeah, and for everyone watching um, that might be new to this kind of discussion, could you explain what exactly period poverty is? Yeah, 
That's so great. There's so many words that kind of, and, and terms that have been used to describe what it is this work is. So menstrual hygiene management is the very technical term um, that has been adopted. Um, and it was adopted by organizations like UNICEF um, and others that have to actually implement when they're a U UNFPA. So UNICEF is a UN agency that does programming for children around the world. And UNFPA is a UN agency that does programming for women and girls around the world. So UNFPA oftentimes um, when there's a huge crisis, they are the institution that shows up to provide prenatal care, to do uh, programming around gender-based violence prevention, and they also um, distribute what are called hygiene kits. Mm -hmm. And UNICEF, as I said, is the, the, um, the UN agency that does a lot of work around children's rights. They, they do a lot of the water and sanitation implementation. And so both of these institutions were going into crises uh, that needed uh, technical terms for addressing what is... Um, the need around menstrual hygiene. Mm -hmm. There has been then more and more effort to think about this as not just a hygiene issue, but that people lack information about menstruation that has ongoing and knock-on effects for their health. So we should be thinking about menstrual health um, management. So people should know what is, you know, what is a cycle, what it means for fertility, how you can manage it in a way that is safe and dignified given the context or the, the materials that you have. Um, what is an abnormal amount of bleeding? And does that mean that you um, need to seek some sort of support or care? Could it mean a you know, longer term fertility issues? So many women and girls experience um, fibroids or endometriosis and they never know it's not normal. And so there was a, an attempt to kind of broaden the terminology. Um, at the same time, when we're starting to think about these human rights issues, what started to come up is not only do we have these difficulties in managing menstruation and, and crisis and conflict contexts or in developing um, contexts, but that there are actual policies put in place um, that tax women mm. for buying menstrual hygiene products in countries like the UK or the US um, and, and elsewhere. And so where men might not be taxed on access to shaving products, menstrual hygiene products were seen as a luxury good that re received tax, uh, or that, that actually have taxes placed on them. Mm. And so when you start to dig in that, uh, this is something that happens for people, uh, people with uteruses around the world, um, you know, and yet there, there are people that cannot manage, they cannot buy the menstrual hygiene product, they cannot access um, the means. The, the idea of poverty um, and period poverty became one of the terminologies that was used to start to address the need for example, um, putting menstrual hygiene products in schools for free uh, in cities, uh, in, in New York City, for example, or right now, um, New Zealand last week um, announced that they would be providing menstrual hygiene products for free in schools. So I wanted to kind of place some of this terminology because there's so much around it, but at the heart of it, we're talking about gender justice mm -hmm. and we're talking about how to um, ensure that menstruation can be managed in a dignified way for all people all the time, anytime they need it. Yeah, you're exactly right. And I would love for you to speak on, you know, what happens when people aren't able to manage their menstrual health in a safe way? It's a, it's a great question. I mean, it looks different in different places. I mean, one of the things that is, is clear is that when it becomes a barrier to girls' education, if you um, are not able to go to school that has safe sanitation facilities, have access to water, have access to menstrual hygiene products, whether they be reusables or not, then you may start to stay home from school. We've even seen conversations around the color of the school uniform can really impact whether or not um, girls are going to feel comfortable going to school during their period. And if you have a child that starts to miss more and more school because she can't ma manage her menstruation, then parents in, in places where it is expensive to just to send children to school, or it's a, it's a financial stretch to send children to, to school, they may decide that it's not worth the investment to continue to, to send a child who's falling behind and not able to go to school. And so then there may be more pressure for, um, for 
that adolescent girl to to find a job, to get married. So the 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 knock on effects of lack of access to to dignified management administration can be quite dire. That might also be the case in the context of work. So Human Rights Watch has looked at the lack of sanitation facilities in um, in factories, for example. So if you have very tight deadlines, you have uh, quotas that have to be met in your factory, um, in the garment industry, for example. If you can't actually leave your your station to go to a safe facility to manage your menstruation, then it may be hours that you you never actually go and manage your your menstruation, or you do and you're actually, um, you, you know, there's punitive in response, you know, you don't meet your quota or um, you're, you face harassment or abuse because of it. So it, it spans lots of different areas, uh, but the, the end result is that um, it impacts gender equality. Women mm. and girls don't have the same access to education or to work um, as men and boys if menstruation becomes a barrier. Yeah, I recently did some work um, in Uganda and I was working with a nonprofit called Kana and we uh, worked to give um, two pairs of panties to schoolgirls um, because we found that sometimes even sending, you know, the products themselves, they don't even have underwear which is another reason where, why they are embarrassed sometimes to talk about it or nervous to go to school or, you know, they're made fun of and it continues to perpetuate the stigma around this being something that you should be ashamed of, or this is something that we can't talk about, or there's something wrong with you for this happening. So I love your point that you made earlier talking about kind of one breaking the stigma, but also it's the education the lack of access to the knowledge about why this is happening and what it means. And it's generational is, you know, when I was on the ground, I found that even the teachers were, they were misinformed as to the best ways to clean themselves and the best way to handle their monthly cycle. So it really is, you know, this, this, this very connected, um, I want to say like holistic kind of view where it's like education to body, to community to the economy it's kind of you know it's 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 such a large issue and I think the stigma around it is why a lot of people aren't talking about it and I'd love for you to talk about what that means to you and how you're kind of trying to break the stigma yeah absolutely I mean I think you know even I, I work with amazing lovely people that you know uh, work on some of the hardest human rights issues around the world and when I took it to you know, some of my colleagues, I, I think that we need to be calling out menstruation as a human rights issue. You know, mm -hmm. the, the, the right to, to manage menstruation with safety and dignity. We, this is something we should do. Nobody was like, a, from a legal perspective, from a human rights perspective, that all clicked, but it took a while for people to realize like, that it was as important of an issue yeah as you know, some of the other work we do on displacement or on torture and abuse. Mm -hmm. And part of that's because people weren't even asking these questions of women when we were you know, talking to um, say prisoners or, or people that have been detained, how, how are they managing their menstruation? Um, and once you start to ask that question, it you know, breaks kind of a flood down. It's you know, creating the space for people to be able to talk about, you know, what it took for them to negotiate access to a pad from a, a, a guard in their detention facility, or how difficult it is um, for, for women to you know, sneak away and manage their menstruation in a, in a displacement camp that doesn't have a safe and dignified place for them to do that. And so I think just starting to socialize and use the terminology, I started to see that people um, in their own work started to ask women more and more about it. But I, I also realized that, I, you know, this is mostly you know, men who haven't had to talk about menstruation. So I felt like I, you know, really made my point and, and had been able to convince even our executive director, menstruation is a human rights issue. Um, and the first time he ever tweeted about it, he misspelled menstruation. And this is one of the smartest people I know. And I realized in his, you know, 
however many decades of work, there's probably never been an instance where he had to actually write out the word menstruation. And how many times that's true for people that are making policies and laws and programs around the world. They've probably never actually had to write out the term menstruation. And that I, that was eight years ago. Um, and the number of times now in UN documents, in human rights documents, in laws and policies that are coming out of different countries from Uganda to the US, all of a sudden that kind of taboo has broken and people are starting at the policy level and people are starting to pass laws and, and write it into policy. Now the next step is you know, that's one level, then actually creating the space to break that stigma and taboo at the local level is, uh, about empowering, empowering women and girls and people who menstruate to, um, to have the access to information, to have, as you said, access to, to even underwear, to be able to um, fully embrace their, their rights and the, their opportunity to have a more dignified way to manage their menstruation. Yeah. That's part. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And I, I love that, you know, the little market asked us to have this conversation because so much of their work is about giving women that dignified option to be able to take care of their families by, you know, providing work to many underserved women, they can then, you know, use that living wage to take care of their families and to provide things like tampons and pads for their children. And I think that that is so important. And I think that underlying message you're completely spot on is just about empowering women and this kind of gender justice that um, will only serve everyone, you know, at the end of the day. Um, what should governments and other institutions be doing to better support women and girls um, so that they can manage their periods with dignity and hygienically? There's, there's so much to do. There's so much to unpack. So I think, you know, I know that climate change is and climate justice is a passion of yours. I think that we really need to be thinking about how to uh, provide opportunities and options that are, are sustainable for women and girls. And one of the things that's true in the United States, for example, is we don't have any information or any consumer product protections for menstrual hygiene products. So if, what that means is that there are chemicals in tampons and there is no need to, uh, no requirement by law to disclose what is in, in these products. And so there are laws that have been, or bills that have been introduced that require uh, companies to, to actually disclose that information. But if you think about, you know, broader reproductive health, if we don't know what is it is being used in the products that we all have to use on a monthly basis, um, you know, how can we ensure, you know, safety and security? So that's one thing. So where there is um, a regulatory gap, governments need to step up and make sure that, that people um, have access to information that they need. Similarly on access to information, Governments need to be providing comprehensive sexuality and sexual health education in schools. That has become politicized in a way that is just not helpful. Girls and boys both and gender non-conforming children, they all need to know the basics of how these work. And when they do, they can do two things. One is they can know as their life progresses more and more about their reproductive health, how to ask questions and feel empowered when they go to see a doctor. But it also means that they learn the basics of how to manage their menstruation safely and without stigma. So comprehensive sexual health education is really an important component of that. Water and sanitation are two necessary components of, of having the enabling environment for menstrual hygiene management. So many countries around the world, including the United States, have water crises that are that are only going to be exacerbated by climate change. Those mm -hmm. water crises range from uh, infrastructure problems, where there's just not enough infrastructure in rural communities and schools, 
to affordability issues. The infrastructure that does exist is crumbling or is being impacted by climate change and the people that have to pay are the people that are least likely or at least able to. Um, and there's a water quality issue where um, increasingly our water around the world is contaminated and it's difficult to manage your menstruation safely and with dignity if your water is contaminated. And so there needs to be real commitment to the rights to water and sanitation. And then finally, it, menstruation has to be a part of labor, it has to be a part of uh, consumer and other regulatory efforts that governments make. It's just, it's just a fact of life. It shouldn't be difficult, but it needs to be a part of all, all types of government planning around um, infrastructure, around laws, and around regulation. There's yeah. more to unpack. Those are some big ones. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, you're, ab you're absolutely right. And I think sometimes, you know, when we think about this, we might not even think that um, these issues are happening in our own country, in our own backyards. And I think you really hit the nail on the head when you're talking about access to clean water and the infrastructure, because I know you're from Texas and we all know the terrible storm that's run through um, Texas in mid-February and, and we're seeing infrastructure issues and these and these these Americans who do not have access to clean water um, at, in the aftermath of the storm. So um, tell us what might that have looked like for women and girls in one of the wealthiest countries of the world and what kind of help they needed? I thank you for asking that question. I mean, it's been really difficult um, to, to watch family and friends, you know, experience the last week because um, living without water, you know, when it, there's it's nine degrees outside and you're not in a weatherized um, house is, is really difficult. And, and then there's been a persistent well water advisory in many communities. It is a, a future that we are going to see more and more. Um, what it means is you know, to, to have not have water for a couple of days, I think we should be you know, prepared that, um, that that could be replicated in many other instances around the United States because of flooding, the massive amounts of flooding that we see coming with hurricanes, but also with other types of flooding, um, with tornadoes where whole entire communities have been torn apart by tornadoes, um, by increased heat that is making it more droughts happen. People have to ration water and they have to do it, you know, oftentimes if it's a crisis situation while they are kind of locked up with, with, their, with their family. And if there's already stigma and taboo, there's not very much water and there's a lot of stress in, in a household, having to take this extra step is really difficult of, of being able to, my, my brother was with melting snow in his backyard to be able to flush his toilet. So, you know, if you're trying in, in without any electricity, right? So if you're trying to melt snow just to be able to have a little bit of water to flush your toilet or to boil some water on a barbecue pit, like, can you imagine, you know, being a 14 year old girl having to go ask your dad to get a little bit of water so you can manage your, your period? I mean, this is, um, yeah. it's really hard to imagine. Um, but you know, there are millions of households throughout the United States that have poor water and sanitation conditions, and they're only going to get worse. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's it's um, it's actually a really important moment looking at Texas mm -hmm. to realize this country, if it's it's serious about climate justice, racial justice, reproductive justice, gender justice, that that being serious about investing in infrastructure that is equitable um, for, for everyone and access to, uh, to these basic necessities for, for all communities, including communities of color. Yeah, oh, I can't imagine. And we'll, you know, obviously we will all continue to pray for your family and hopefully that they are safe. Um, you know, it's a lot, it's a lot, right? Like, I mean, I, as a person who cares so deeply about so many things from climate to social justice to, you know, gender justice, there, you know, with the new administration and this, and there's just so many things, so many moving parts. And honestly, it can be a bit daunting and it can feel like, how can anyone, how can we possibly make a difference here? And I always like to, when I have these kinds of, kinds of uh, conversations to just ask, what gives you hope? 
what keeps you going to keep fighting this fight? just so amazed at the kind of journey of the menstrual health, menstrual hygiene kind of advocacy in the last few years. It really was something you could not say without there being snickers by like, you know, by even, you know, grown men in a room. And, and now it's, it's a topic that people feel comfortable raising uh, across the board, it's it's really there has been such a shift, and I think you know this conversation today is a great example of what we can do to continue the conversation, bring awareness, make people feel comfortable talking about it, and then thinking about the things that need to happen, like buying panties, empowering women, um, you know, asking are there policies in my own community that are preventing women and girls and other people who menstruate from accessing the resources they need to have that dignified life. Does that mean you know, homeless women in my community need access to um, menstrual hygiene products and can I do something about that? Um, does it mean you know some schools don't have, you know, children in some schools aren't able to access um, you know, tampons and, and, and pads and is that something that our school board should take up and do you know are there bills like the one I mentioned um, that are going to make companies say what's in their products so that women aren't you know ingesting toxins when they are menstruating and can I tell call my um, my lawmaker and tell them that's important to me so there there's so much that we can do to move this style just a little bit each each day uh, and I, I think that I'm encouraged that we're in a totally different space on this issue than we were a few years ago. And I think it's only going to get better. I hope so. I am hopeful for, um, yeah, for, for the progress that we're making and for the work that you're doing. Um, you know, we can't thank you enough. And I'm so grateful for the Little Market and Hannah and Lauren for having us on to have this conversation. Um, it was so nice to talk to you. I hope we can continue this conversation. I can support you and your work however you might need. Um, so thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me today. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Thank you for the work that you do. I, you know, it's um, changing girls' lives just to be able to access panties. It, it makes you know, a life-changing moment um, and it doesn't feel like it's so hard to do. We can all do something and it's yeah. amazing the work that you're doing. Exactly right. Well, thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks.